Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see you all here. Um, we like you to fill out the yellow cards uh, that are in the pews, and if you can drop those in the offering plate when that comes by a little bit later in the service. Um, special welcome to those who may be watching from home or for, for our, or wherever you're at on Facebook. So uh, glad that you're joining us uh, in this way as well. A few things to call to your attention. Uh, we are now in the season of Lent. We began this past Wednesday with our Ash Wednesday worship. And for the next five Wednesday nights, we'll have uh, midweek worship uh, both at noon. Uh, it'll be a prayer service uh, with Holy Communion and, uh, and then uh, evening service at 6.30 using Holden Evening Prayer. And our theme for that will be uh, uh, living uh, our baptismal covenant. Uh, so each of the five Wednesdays will uh, address uh, one of those five promises that we make in the affirmation of baptism service. There are a number of other opportunities uh, during for Lent, uh, you know, throughout our Lyft congregations. Uh, there's a yellow insert in your bulletin. Uh, take a look at that uh, so that you're aware of those other opportunities. Uh, just a few notes about little some changes in the order of service. We will be using ELW setting three, that's setting one in the green book in the LBW. Uh, during the season of Lent, we, we, we sing the Kyrie, but we omit the Alleluias, um, including before the gospel, and instead of uh, the Alleluia, we will be singing the Lenten sentence. And those, um, uh, of course, are in your bulletin. One additional thing and change that we're making for the season of Lent is that for the um, confession and forgiveness, it begins with the congregation standing, but then when it comes time for the congregation uh, for the corporate confession, uh, we're going to give you the option for kneeling. Okay, so you can kneel, stand, or sit, whatever your choice is for that uh, during the confessional service. So, um, Today is the first Sunday, uh, which means noisy offering. So let's make some noise. Oh, there we go. It starts out good there. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> there's the handful method and then there's the baggy method. They both work they both work very well. <laughs> and then the quiet money is that's that's very acceptable also. Okay, thank you uh, for your offerings. Uh, the benefit uh, for our noisy offering uh, uh, for right now is uh, the Noah's Ark Preschool. So, again, thank you for your generosity. Our worship continues with confession and forgiveness, and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. <clears throat> mm. 
and most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. We sing the hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide us now so that following your Son, we may walk safely through the wilderness of this world toward the life you alone can give. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. First reading for today is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Armenian was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord of God of our ancestors, the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all of the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your life, and to your house. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading found in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 8 through 13. The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite... I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. I thought I jumped the gun. Hey, Molly. So when I was a little kid, um, it was real popular to have these letters on a bracelet or a necklace. Do you know what the letters WWJD stand for? No? Well, this... It stands for, what would Jesus do? So when I was probably fifth or sixth grade, it was really popular. Like, everybody had a bracelet that said WWJD on it. Well, almost everybody. It seemed like it was the popular thing to do. But why would we wear a bracelet or a necklace or something that said WWJD? What do you think? 
What kind of reminder could it have been? It was a reminder of Jesus. That's right. And it was also a reminder that wherever we went while we were wearing that bracelet, that we should stop and think about how we react And we should react in a way that maybe Jesus would, with kindness and compassion for other people. Well, in today's gospel, we're going to learn about Jesus when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And Jesus was able to resist those temptations. So the next time that we're tempted to do something, we can say, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Or if we need help, finding out what Jesus would do. Where would we look? In the Bible, that's right. Because the Bible helps us learn about Jesus and how, what he would do so that we can resist temptations ourselves. I invite you to join me in prayer, and the congregation may join along. Dear God, help us use your word and follow Jesus' example in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Molly. You may go back to your seat. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, one does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, to you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, give us the strength we need to resist the temptations of the evil one. We pray this in your name. Amen. At our Ash Wednesday worship, we began the observance of the penitential season of Lent by confessing our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Of the many sins that we could confess, one sin stands out for many of us, and that is the sin of lying. When I was in the third grade, our teacher, Mrs. Schultz, would sit at her desk and call out our names to ask what our grade was on our math quiz so she could record the score in her grade book. When she called my name for a time there, I would always say 100, a perfect score. Problem was, I didn't always get 100. 
In fact, my score was rarely perfect. But I lied. I lied. That's the bad part. The good part is that my conscience bothered me to the point that eventually I went to Mrs. Schultz in tears, confessing my sin of lying. You know, lying is so much a part of everyday life. I did a Google search to find examples of lies that people have told to get whatever it was that they wanted. And there were some doozies in this list of 30 examples, but this one was the most shocking. This woman confesses on this website about lying. She said, my husband and I told our kids that Barney the dinosaur died so we didn't have to watch it anymore. (laughs) How about you? Have you ever been on either the giving or receiving end of a lie? Numerous studies tell us that lying is one of our most common sins. The book, The Day America Told the Truth, says that 91% of those surveyed lie routinely about matters they considered trivial, and 36% lie about important matters. 86% lie regularly to parents, 75% to friends, 73% to siblings, and 69% to spouses. But why does that matter to us today? Isn't our gospel text about sin and temptation in general? Lying is just one of a million different sins that is available to us. But let me make this suggestion. A lie is the basis of every other sin. Think about that. The sin of adultery starts with a lie. A little harmless flirtation, that's all it is. The sin of stealing starts with a lie. Come on, you deserve it. Who's it going to hurt? The sin of gossip starts with a lie. I was only sharing it because I was concerned about... The great lawyer Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, sin has many tools, but a lie is that handle that fits them all. In the eighth chapter of John's gospel, Jesus says this to the devil. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, the father of lies. In our gospel text for today, Jesus, following the lead of the Holy Spirit, heads into the wilderness. He does not eat for 40 days, and in his moment of weakness, the devil appears to him and begins tempting him. And of course, the devil begins these temptations with a lie. If you are the son of God, the devil says to Jesus. But of course, the devil knows full well who Jesus is. But it doesn't hurt to throw your opponent off at the beginning of the game. In sports, it's called trash talking. Convince your opponent that he isn't all that big and tough and powerful. Try to find that weakness, that crack in his armor. Vince Lombardi, the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers, used a similar strategy preparing game plans. He studied the opponent's defensive unit until he could identify their four best defenders. Then Lombardi decided Green Bay's first six plays of the game to be run directly at those four players. His theory was simple. Attack the other team's heart. If you can take away your opponent's spirit, you can win every time. Now, the devil uses this technique on us, too. Whenever we catch ourselves saying things such as, if my husband really loved me, he wouldn't work so much overtime. If my bosses appreciated me, they'd give me that raise. If I were just a stronger person, I wouldn't get upset over such a trivial thing. If my parents really cared about me, they'd let me do what the other kids do. And the most effective lies the devil uses haven't changed over time. He failed in using them with Jesus, but he often succeeds when he uses them with us. The three lies Satan uses are, if it feels good, do it. Live only for the moment. And the third is look out for number one. Let's take a closer look at each of these 
three lies. The first one is, if it feels good, do it. The first temptation Jesus faced was to turn stones into bread, to fulfill his physical needs. Now, at the time, this temptation sounded so reasonable. Jesus hadn't eaten for 40 days. Hunger surely dominated his every thought. He had the power to stop suffering. Why not just do it? Because Jesus needed to feel the pain. It was part of the growth process necessary to his ministry. Look through the Bible, you'll see that before God uses people, God often leads, leads them into a desert, a wilderness time in their own life. Certainly that happened with the people of Israel. It was part of the purification process. Jesus needed to trust God to provide for his needs on God's timetable, not his own. Well, maybe you've never wandered in a literal desert for 40 days. Maybe you've never gone more than six hours without a meal. So you think you can't relate to this first temptation. But let's look at it another way. Maybe you have entered a desert time in your life, a, a time when you feel lost, unfulfilled, disconnected from God. Maybe your pain doesn't come from hunger. It comes from being buried in debt or caught in a tough situation in a particular area of your life. And the devil comes to you with a perfectly reasonable thought. You have the power to stop your own suffering. If you're stuck in debt, you can always start buying lottery tickets. The thing that's really taking off now in, 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 in we could say, a bad way is sports betting. Big time. And the research is revealing that the risk of addiction is higher for young adults, and sports bettors are actually more than twice as likely to develop a gambling problem. Cheat on your taxes? If it feels good, do it. Of course, the corollary to that is stop the pain at all costs. And for Pete's sake, don't try to learn from your pain. Don't let this experience mature you, purify you, discipline you. But not every good thing feels good at the moment, and not every bad thing hurts us at first. But that is the first lie the tempter uses on us. If it feels good, do it. The next lie the devil uses on us is live only for the moment. Seize the day. Carpe diem is the saying. Well, that's, a, that's an okay motto, motto to live by, but living only for the moment results in making temporary things more important than eternal things. The urgent matters crowd out the essentials. By worshiping the devil, Jesus could have avoided dying on the cross. The devil always offers pleasure without pain and gain without effort. Many commentators suggest that the second temptation to give all the kingdoms of the world to Jesus, if he would worship the devil, was an appeal to Jesus' need for power. But one commentator suggests that the devil was actually appealing to Jesus' sense of compassion. As the Son of God, Jesus already owned all the kingdoms of the world. But this commentator suggests that the devil was offering to remove his own power of evil from those kingdoms. This would mean no more corrupt governments, no more oppressive Oppression by evil rulers, at least for a time. Surely this approach would appeal to Jesus' compassion. But it would mean forsaking God's plan for the salvation of the world. Eventually, we would all have to face the terrible consequence of Jesus' choice. But that's the second temptation. Live only for the moment. The final lie the devil used on Jesus and uses on us today is look out for number one. And once again, it sounds reasonable. If you love yourself first, then you can properly love others. If you don't look out for your own needs, no one else will. Grab the, the biggest piece of cake. You've earned it. Every man for himself. We all have that basic insecurity, don't we, that causes us to grab for what we can get and let the other guy fend for himself. According to evolutionary theory, this insecurity makes sense. But according to the Bible, 
according to scripture, it is the last who will be first. The servant who will be exalted. And those who are willing to lose their lives are the ones who will save them. It's a backwards kind of thinking that will set our world right. Think about this. The devil's suggestion that Jesus stand atop the temple and throw himself off is not so outrageous. In ancient rabbinical writings, there was the passage that read, when the king Messiah reveals himself, then he comes and stands on the roof of the holy place. If Jesus had stood atop the temple and thrown himself off, he would have proven that he was the Messiah. And many would have worshipped him as a miracle worker. But Jesus wanted to do more than perform miracles or receive our worship. He wanted to save us from the power of death. And that meant he had to stay within God's will and not give in to the temptation to look out for number one. A historical example of one who looked out for number one was Napoleon. In 1812, Napoleon and his army advanced into Russia. He had been warned about the Russian winters but didn't pay much attention. By September 14th, his French army had reached Moscow, but the Russians counterattacked, and the cold winter did the rest. Forced to retreat, Napoleon and his once proud army returned to France after a bitter two-month march. He had led more than 500,000 French soldiers into Russia, but fewer than 20,000 made it back to France, and most of them were sick from typhus, frostbite, and starvation. But Napoleon did not seem to be bothered that he had left no fewer than 408,000 husbands, fathers, and sons dead in the Russian snow. Napoleon was just looking out for number one. As we continue to watch this tragedy unfold in Ukraine, can there be any doubt that Vladimir Putin is doing the same thing? Looking out for number one, that's all he's concerned about. You've seen that photo of him sitting at the very end of a long table all by himself with his advisor seated way at the other end. A vivid image that communicates that Putin is in this only for himself. Contrast that attitude with Jesus' attitude in the desert. If Jesus had chosen Satan's way, he could have been a Messiah without all the mess. He could have had the temporary pleasure of power and popularity. He could have bypassed dealing with thick-headed disciples or insecure religious leaders. He wouldn't have had to be humiliated and persecuted. He wouldn't have had to suffer and die a horrible death of crucifixion on a cross. But God's plan for the world would not have been fulfilled, and we would still be lost in our sin. So these are the three lies the devil used on Jesus. If it feels good, do it. Live only for the moment and look out for number one. But wait, there's a greater lie than any of these. In fact, it is at the heart of these lies and all others that the devils of the devil's arsenal. It is also the one we are, we are most likely to believe. And here's the greatest lie of all. You can't trust God. God's promises. You can't trust that God loves you. You can't trust that God has a future and a hope for you. You can't trust that God will provide for all your needs. It was true in the case of Adam and Eve, and it's true in our case today. When we let go of our trust in God's promises, we are vulnerable to every other lie that may mislead us. Christian writer Bruce Larson says that the devil's strategy is not to convince us that God doesn't exist. No, it's more insidious than that. Instead, the basic lie, says Larson, is that we cannot trust God. For God wants to take all the fun out of life, or so we think. The devil tries to convince us that the abundant life is the loser's life, that pleasure is better than joy, that social status is more important than inner peace, that now is the only moment. But it's all a lie. Our response to temptation will be based on whether we believe God's promises or the devil's lies. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God has a purpose for your life? 
If you do, then you are ready to meet the tempter. And with God's help, you will prevail. Amen. We sing the hymn. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church. Sharpen its proclamation of the word so that your people learn to reject voices of de deception and distraction. Strengthen all who are tempted to believe lies about themselves or others. Merciful God, receive our prayer. 
We pray for the earth and all its creatures. Protect wilderness places and all plant and animal species that call them home. Sustain farmers and all laborers who work the land and harvest the fruits of its abundance. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for the nations of the world, especially the Ukraine. Move those who mean them harm to lay down their weapons and seek a way of peace. Awaken elected leaders and government officials to the needs of those who are oppressed and grant them compassion to deal mercifully with immigrants and refugees who reside among us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for those in need. Rescue those experiencing mental illness or contending with addiction. Ease the anxiety of those who live with dementia. Command your angels concerning all who are sick. Today, we especially pray for Harry, Richard, Joanne, and Paige. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray for this assembly. Bless those who prepare the table for our communion celebration. Accompany those who share the bounty of this meal with those who are homebound or hospitalized. Continue to guide the call committee as we wait for you to reveal our next senior pastor. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for those who have died. Gather them with all the saints into your heavenly dwelling place. Encourage us with the promise that all who call upon your name are saved. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of peace with one another. You may be seated. We will now receive the offering, and would you please take this opportunity to fill out that yellow welcome card? and place it in the offering plate as it goes by.
Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with, with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast where you offer us the food that satisfy. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you send to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, for supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here is food and drink for the journey. Take and be filled. You may be seated. Uh, we are beginning now to come forward. Those who wish to come forward are encouraged to do so. If you are still receiving communion in the pews, if you could make, is there anyone doing that this morning? Anyone? Can you raise your hand if you are? Okay. I'll assume that we'll, we'll all be coming forward for communion. Um, so come, for all is not ready. Body of Christ given for you. 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 The body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. The 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 body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Body of Christ given for you. Okay. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body of Christ given for you. 
the blood of Christ shed for you, the body of Christ given for you, Amen. the blood of Christ shed for you, Amen. the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ in his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We bless Jesus in this rich meal of grace you have fed us with your body, the bread of life. Now send us forth to bear your life-giving hope to a world in need. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. You are children of God, anointed with the oil of gladness and strengthened for the journey. Almighty God, motherly, majestic, and mighty, bless you this day and always. Amen. Amen. We sing the hymn. <clears throat>
in peace. Jesus meets you on the way. Thanks be to God. Heather, oops, can I get the red mic up here for this morning? 